All right. Well, Shabbat Shalom to everybody. Good to, uh, to be back. Uh, for those that are watching, of course, uh, this video on YouTube, by all means, uh, find us on Rumble as well. Get used to Rumble. Who knows how much longer YouTube will have us. So you can always go to Rumble. We're picking up really where we left off a couple weeks ago. We're talking about, well, biblically, what Revelation 14 and 18 calls Babylon the Great. Uh, I'm simply calling it the New World Order. Uh, those that are watching on YouTube, you will see a cute little disclaimer underneath the picture. It's made courtesy of Wikipedia, and I'll read it to you. It says, the New World Order is a conspiracy theory that hypothesizes a secretly emerging totalitarian world government. I will have you know it's not a conspiracy theory because, well, the book of Revelation speaks of this. And it's going to come to pass, because it has to. It has to. My hope is that in these final few lessons here, it should give you hope. Don't get discouraged by what you see happening in our country or in the world. By all means, no. In fact, it should encourage you when you see these things, because guess what? It just goes to show your Bible is correct 100% of the time. So these things are going to happen. But you also should know once these things are happening and it continues, it's going to come to fruition. That system, Babylon the Great, will be destroyed by our Lord. Yeshua will come, he will destroy it, and he will set up his own kingdom. So we win. Let's eat, right? But uh, a term that you're going to be hearing, uh, you're starting to hear it. Really, it's been in the works for a, uh, quite a number of years. It's called global citizenship. Okay. Mm, somebody felt something on that. Let me uh, read to you. It says, the United Nations, in cooperation with 36 multilateral organizations working together, assembled for the one UN Climate Change Learning Partnership. Their material states, quote, climate change asks us to consider the world beyond ourselves. More than that, it asks that we consider a time present or beyond the present incorporating the topic into school curriculum only stands to bring students closer to their communities. Civic engagement, one of the most important lessons schools impart on their students, can be taught through student engagement with local institutions. How are their communities working to be more sustainable? What policies are governments putting in place and how might students push for more? It is not enough to simply teach students about the science behind climate change. Students also need to learn how institutions and individuals deal with problems of this scale and how they fit into that larger picture. As long as schools have a responsibility to teach global citizenship and community stewardship, they have reason to teach about climate change." End quote. One of the reasons why I gave you that little short volume of lessons on climate change before is because as this system is being put in place, it will be put on, in place under the banner of climate change. That's at least one. Do we have a date on this? Of course not. Nobody knows that except the Lord himself. But notice you're going to hear more about global citizenship, global citizenship, global citizenry, not national citizenship. Because if you're going to have national citizenship, then you're probably going to have a national government. If you're going to have a national government, you would have to have a national leader. No, we need global citizenship. So what's the goal? A one world government, which is not a conspiracy theory. A one world government, which would have a one world leader. Right, Nimrod? Let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered across all over the world. Daniel 9, verse 27, speaks of this leader. Refer to him as the Antichrist. That's what most people know, anti-Messiah. In verse 27 of Daniel 9, it says, And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, for seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years in, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come 
one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So yes, this one world leader is going to emerge and will make a covenant with Israel. Of course, the covenant will be worth the paper it's printed on. But Israel will believe and be duped into thinking that they have peace when there is no peace. Andrew Thornbrook, writing, writing for the Federalist, this was back in December of 2021, because really, we want to find out, is this a conspiracy theory? He writes, in a 2018 speech, Chinese President Xi said the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, must, quote, lead the reform of the global governance system. In another speech in 2021, he said, quote, a more just and equitable international order must be heeded and led by China. I thought it was a conspiracy theory. Likewise, the paper of the CCP's Central Party School issued an article in 2016, shortly after Xi's military reforms that declared it was, quote, only a matter of time before the CCP was among those, his words, leading the new world order. Man, what's wrong with Wikipedia? They better get on track. At a closed-door CCP meeting in November of 2021 called the Sixth Plenum, Xi led the party in issuing a communique that rewrote parts of China's modern history. Wait a minute. Rewrote modern history. What did Michelle Obama tell you back in 2008? You're going to have to change your history. and outline the party's goals for the future. In it, the CCP championed its own form of Maoist communism, referred to as, quote, socialism with Chinese characteristics, as a new model for human advancement. It further demanded that Marxist ideology be proselytized across the world as the sole political philosophy. Quote, not only capable of dismantling the old world, but also of building a new one. We must use Marxist positions, viewpoints, and methods to observe, understand, and steer the trends of the times and constantly deepen our understanding of the laws underlying governance by a communist party, the building of socialism, and the development of human society." End quote. Klaus Schwab, July of 2020, said, quote, many of us are pondering when things will return to normal. The short response is never. Nothing will ever return to the broken sense of normalcy that prevailed prior to the crisis because the coronavirus pandemic marks a fundamental inflection point in our global trajectory. So that spirit of Nimrod is alive and well. Um, excellent book written by Professor Peter Wood. It's called 1620, and if there's anything I love more uh, well, outside of the Bible is studying uh, American history. And Peter Wood, in his book 1620, A Critical Response to the 1619 Project, just takes the 1619 Project and just dismantles it. And he does so by, you'd never guess, American history. Uh, but he writes in there, he says, uh, uh, quote, global citizens is a widely used phrase on the campus left. It signals disenchantment with the idea of a nation state and with quote unquote citizenship as usually understood. Global citizens are at least by disposition, loyal to no particular place, people, culture, or government. They are quote, post-national and see themselves as operating on a plane above the parochial attachments of ordinary people. Global citizenship, is a self-conferred elite status, and it helps to have a peer group of similarly liberated intellectuals and some sponsoring organizations that are willing to write checks to support expressions of the attitude. So you're going to continue to hear that more, less and less national citizenship. In fact, you know, it used to be a time in America, people were proud to be American, but 
if I just continue to tell you over and over and over and over, generation after generation, that America is not worthy to be proud of, well, then you will grow to hate it. Who wants to be a citizen of a, of a racist nation? So I would much rather be a citizen of the world. Now, I shared with you in our last lesson what President Roosevelt said in his famous uh, Fourth Freedom speech. Roosevelt, uh, for those of you that aren't up to speed, especially with American history, even recent American history, he was in his fourth term when he passed away. Uh, at the time, there were no term limits as far as presidents go, so he was in his fourth term. Uh, he died, of course, then Harry S. Truman took over. Truman was the president when World War II came to an end. Uh, he gave way to a five-star general, Dwight D. Eisenhower. There haven't been many five-star generals uh, in our history. Eisenhower was one of them. MacArthur was another one. I forgot there's a couple more. But Eisenhower became president. In 1961, which was his last speech, he said these words. And of course, he gave way to John F. Kennedy. But listen to these words. It's one of the most important speeches that was ever written and ever spoken. And Eisenhower said this in 1961, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together." End quote. That came from a five-star general who is telling you, do not give that kind of power to the military or any government. Don't do it. If you hand over that kind of power, then you will lose your freedom. When a nation has been established on biblical principles and ethics, that nation is to set the standard. Now, God himself established Israel. <laughs> I, I'm going to make out of you, Abraham, I'm going to do this. I'm going to create a nation from you. I'm going to redeem Israel out of Egypt. I'm going to give you my Torah. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to give you a land with milk and honey, flowing with milk and honey. This is what I'm going to do. So God established Israel. God used righteous, God-fearing men to establish America. God established Israel himself. He used men to establish America. And they understood, do not give power to the government. Keep the power with the people. And as in addition to that, they're very clear. This is a moral country that we are putting together here. It's a moral country by moral people, and it can only be maintained by moral people. You set the standard when you are in the truth. When you're in the light, you set the standard. Israel, I chose you. I'm establishing you. You set the standard. What happens when you don't? And we see that in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 20, beginning of verse 27. Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me by acting treacherously against me. When I have brought them into the land which I swore to give them, then they saw every high hill and every leafy tree, and they offered there their sacrifices, and there they presented the provocation of their offering. There they also made their soothing aroma, and there they poured out their drink offerings. Then I said to them, What is the high place to which you go? 
So its name is called Bama to this day. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Will you defile yourselves after the manner of your fathers and play the harlot after your detestable things? When you offer your gifts, when you cause your sons to pass through the fire, you are defiling yourselves with all your idols to this day, and shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, declares the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. What comes into your mind will not come about when you say, we will be like the nations, like the tribes of the land serving wood and stone. Imagine, God established a nation to set the standard, and here are these very same people who are offering their children in sacrifice saying, we want to be like the other nations. We want a king like all the other nations. You got it. Saul is your guy. And you're going to regret the day. 2 Corinthians 6.17 Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. America has been established far differently from the very foundations than other nations. And at one point, we did set the standard. Now you have other nations around the world laughing at us, mocking us. By chance, do you know Russian generals? Not Putin, Russian generals, though. Guess who they're reaching out to? Arab nations. Arab nations, join with us as we take on the West. And guess what they're saying about America to the Arab nations? Look at America. Look at what they're doing to marriage. Look at, look at the pride. Look at the nudity in the streets. Look at what they're doing to their children. They're mutilating their children. They're cutting the breasts off their daughters. They're castrating their sons. Look at what America is doing. We should be setting the standard. The globalists have come up with a, even a new school pledge. It used to be, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic. Remember, America is not a democracy. America is a constitutional republic. Our voting system is democratic. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ah, they change it. You ready? I pledge allegiance to the world to care for earth, sea, and air, to honor every living thing with peace and justice everywhere. Don't get lost in the details. Babylon the Great is an ideology. It's a system. It has numerous tentacles. Don't get lost in the details. The details, and there are many of them, and many more to come. I mean, you got vaccine passports and vaccine mandates and microchips and 5G towers and 15-minute cities. You've got all the details. Don't get lost in the details. They're just little puzzle pieces. It's a mindset. It's not about forcing you. It's about making a new human out of you, a different kind of human. Deuteronomy 6.4, we know it so well. The Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you should speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you retire, and when you arise. And then what? And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and let them be frontless between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. What does that mean? Your hand, everything you do, everything you do, whatever you put your hands to, should be about me. Everything you think, your mindset, your passions, everything, your heart has to do with me. Satan comes along and says, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to change all that. Everything you do, Everything you think, you're going to be worshiping me. And those tentacles spread, spread out into, across many spectrums. Many spectrums. 
It's how you think. It is about taking God, who is creator, rejecting him, and I will worship the adversary. And I long to do it. It's rare when I read long quotes. I don't really like it. It's tedious. Epoch Times put out the specter of communism. So it's a long quote. The information in it is vital for you to understand. And I trust me, get the information, because once you, what you see going on in the culture, what you see going on in the business world, what you see going on in the medical world, what, all of that, it'll make a whole lot more sense. Put on the biblical glasses and then watch the news. Beginning with the Renaissance, human history entered a period of dramatic change in the late 18th century. The Industrial Revolution greatly increased productivity, which spurred social upheaval as well as profound shifts in philosophy and spirituality. As technology advanced, materialist and atheistic ideas became prominent. Increasing numbers of people rejected traditional morality and belief in the divine. Against this historical backdrop, the specter of communism, and I've said that is a spirit, it is a spirit of antichrist. The specter of communism has turned globalization into a powerful tool for its goal of separating people from their traditional cultures and faiths. While globalization provides opportunities for international cooperation and understanding, the breakdown of boundaries between nations and economies allows the specter to combine the worst aspects of both the communist and non-communist systems, pursuing broad political and cultural operations to further its agenda around the world. The globalized economic and financial system facilitates this process, making it even harder for individual communities and nations to resist the communist specter's onslaught. Again, it is a system, it's a mindset, it's an ideology that goes across many spectrums. Government, finance, commerce, education, religion, art, travel, all of it. All of it. This book has stressed that communism is not merely a theory but an evil specter. It is alive, and in pursuing its ultimate goal to destroy humankind, it is capable of nearly any kind of mutation that helps it sustain and expand itself. Since the 1990s, globalization ostensibly has been about furthering democracy, the market economy, and free trade, and has therefore met with opposition from a number of left-wing groups and figures, but these individuals don't realize that it is actually the communist specter operating on another plane. Communism's aim isn't to use globalization to create a better world, but to take over the world by imposing an ideology of globalist control on all the world's nations. Globalism has made astounding progress on a variety of fronts, particularly in the economic, political, and cultural spheres. As an ideological force, Globalism has many faces and manifests in diverse, even superficially contradictory forms, often eliciting nebulous feelings of a world free from war, poverty, discrimination, or exploitation. But in practice, the methods proposed to achieve these things are essentially similar to the utopian lies of communist revolution. Though each nation has its own culture and history, their diverse traditions contain universal moral co values common to all humankind. Let me interject. That's what's beautiful, beautiful about our faith. We all There's different colors, there's different sizes, there's different languages, there's different, right? Different foods, different tastes, all these things. Yet there is one common amongst everybody in this room. Him. That's our Father. And so bring your culture. And bring your language and bring and bring your foods and bring the colors. One Father, one Spirit, one truth. National sovereignty 
and cultural traditions of each ethnic group play an important role in national heritage and self-determination and offer collective pr protection in the face of various threats from natural disasters to military invasions. Again, remember September 11th. On September 11th, with all of our diversity, guess what? We were one nation. We were, suddenly, it took 3,000 dead people for us to look at one another and say, you know what, we're Americans. Those days are gone. Additionally, an ethnic group's national legends and religious faith help the ent entire people maintain a sense of identity and protect them from falling for the specter's evil designs. While globalists often claim to stand for the cultures of all ethnicities, in recent years it has become increasingly apparent that this ideology actually serves to strengthen leftist causes. Instead of supporting traditional culture, which is rooted in faith and virtue, globalist talking points tend to mirror the left's political correctness, social justice, value neutrality, and absolute egalitarianism. Establishing a world government, starting with increased supernatural bodies and regulation, is the main end goal of globalism. The formation of a global supergovernment would bring communism within striking distance of achieving its goal to eliminate private property rights, sovereign states, distinctive races, and the traditional culture of each nation. What are you seeing on, on the border? We have no borders. It's just one world. See? And once that goes ahead and that's universally accepted, then you, do, you have to understand, if a nation does not have borders, then guess what? Neither does your home. We don't have our own nation. You will not have your own home. And you cannot say, I will not have that person in my home. It's not yours. Oh, conspiracy theory. Genesis 11.4. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth, the very thing that God wanted. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. No, 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 no. One name. And Nimrod actually said, yeah, no, yeah, it's a great idea. In fact, I want to be the leader. Karl Marx did not mention the concept of globalism in his writings, but instead used the term world history, which has similar connotations. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and co-author Friedrich Engels claim that the global expansion of capitalism would inevitably produce a huge proletariat, working class, in the industrialized nations, and that a proletarian revolution would soon sweep the globe, overthrowing capitalism and achieving the paradise of communism. Marx and Engels also wrote, quote, the proletariat can thus only exist world historically, just as communism, its activity, can only have a world historical existence, end quote. That is to say, the realization of communism depends on the proletariat taking joint action around the world. The communist revolution must be a global movement. Later, Vladimir Lenin modified Marx's doctrine and proposed that the world revolution could be initiated in Russia, despite the predominantly rural character of its society at the time. In 1919, the Soviet communists established the Communist International in Moscow, with branches spread throughout more than 60 countries. Lenin said that the goal of the Communist International was to establish a world Soviet republic. Joseph Stalin, the Soviet leader who succeeded Lenin, was known for the temporary policy of, quote, socialism in one country, but proposed several goals of the communist global revolution in his book, Marxism and the National Question. American thinker G. Edward Griffin summarized Stalin's points as follows, quote, confuse, disorganize, and destroy the forces of capitalism around the world. Bring all nations together into a single world system of economy. Stalin was saying that. 
force the advanced countries to pour prolonged financial aid into the undeveloped countries. You're seeing that now. One spending bill after another spending bill after another spending bill. We're sending more money, billions more, billions more. What happens? Inflation goes up. What does inflation do to your bank, your bank account? Your bank account starts going down because your money in your bank is suddenly going overseas. Divide the world into regional groups as a transitional stage toward total world government. Populations will more readily abandon their national loyalties to a vague regional loyalty than they will for a world authority. Later, the regionals, such as NATO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, the Organization of American States, can be brought all the way into a single world dictatorship of the proletariat. Let me interject. So let's take, for instance, you had, you know, the teachers in the classroom are just going to pull their hair out when I say, imagine a classroom of 105 year olds. Yeah, I know, everybody's thinking, oh my God. All right, 105 year olds. How are you going to control them all? But if I divide them into groups, like five groups of 20, and I put a teacher in each class, will you be able to control them easier? Of course. Do you remember, look, it's, it's amazing when you look back at history. You had, you know, out of the 80s, then you had, of course, George Herbert Walker Bush, then eight years of Clinton, then eight years of Obama, and then the big mouth came, right? Whatever you want to say about him, arrogant, nasty, can't control his tongue, brilliant business mind. And what did he tell you? He said, NATO needs to be dismantled. Why do we have NATO anymore? And the liberals lost it. Why? We're trying to consolidate everything. We're trying to build a one world government here. You want to break it apart? Let us say, make ourselves a name. One name, one government, one leader. William Z. Foster, the former national chairman of the Communist Party USA. Yes. Yes, there is a Communist Party in the United States, and they are very well funded. Oh, in fact, if you go and you look and you see some of the uh, politicians that they give money to, Communist Party giving politicians money, a rather interesting list. I'll let you do that. But this is what he wrote. This was a few decades ago. Listen, quote, a communist world will be a unified, organized world. The economic system will be one great organization based upon the principle of planning now dawning in the USSR. The American Soviet government Rewind. The American Soviet government will be an important section in this world government. From the actions of Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and Foster to the community of human destiny, proposed by the leadership of communist China, it may be seen that communists are not satisfied with wielding power in just a few countries. Communism, in all its forms, is bent on world domination. The proletarian world revolution failed to take place in the form Marx envisioned. What he thought were desperate and dying capitalist societies were instead prosperous and flourishing thanks to the institutions of private ownership and rule of law. Isn't that amazing? Like God's economic system actually works. Who would have thought? With the collapse of the Soviet and Eastern European communist camp and the adoption of market principles by the Chinese Communist Party, it appeared that the free world had triumphed over communism. But the communist specter hides behind various doctrines and movements as it corrodes, infiltrates, and expands communist elements into every corner of the world. Socialism the primary stage of communism. And if you don't believe me, ask Canada. Has been gaining currency internationally, piggybacking on the destabilizing aspects brought about by globalization and globalist factors. After World War II, the left-wing forces in European countries continued to grow, 
the Socialist International, which advocated democratic socialism, included political parties from more than 100 countries. These parties were in power in various countries and spread across most of Europe, driving policies of generous welfare, high taxation, and increased state ownership. Can anybody say France? Globalization has hollowed out U.S. industry, shrunk the middle class, caused incomes to stagnate, polarized the rich and the poor, and driven rifts in society. This has greatly aided the growth in popularity of the left and socialism in the United States and shifted the global political spectrum sharply left in the last decade or so. Left-wing forces foster anti-globalization sentiment, pinning the blame for the world's ills on capitalism and advocating socialist policies. After the Cold War, anti-traditional trends infiltrated the development of economic globalization with the goal of undermining the sovereignty of each country's economic foundation. Human greed, once contained and managed within communities, was internationalized and thus became a powerful global force. In the last decades, Western financial power shifted wealth accumulated by society over several hundred years to quickly build up the economy of mainland China following the CCP's market reform. The CCP used these investments to prop up its regime while binding foreign businesses and leaders to its corrupt system. As the head of the communist forces in the world today, the CCP aims to build up a socialist economic superpower while fortifying left-wing and communist parties around the world. Its totalitarian system upended the rules of normal trade and it intends to use the enrichment and gain from democratic free markets to co-op and subvert them from within. The CCP's economic strength has also spurred on its political and military ambitions as it attempts to export its authoritarian communist model throughout the world. Looking at the CCP's globalized strategy from the perspective of Marx, Lenin, and Stalin, today's world has many of the conditions necessary for communist revolution. By the way, does anybody know who has the largest navy in the world now? China. Not the United States anymore. Because our own politicians have been cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. And while we're cutting, China is increasing, increasing, increasing. As cultural exchanges and capital flows expand throughout the world, the various deviant cultural forms that communism has established over the past century such as modern art, literature, and thought, deviant entertainment and lifestyles, and consumerism are transmitted globally. During this process, the traditions of various ethnic groups are interrupted and severed from their original meaning, resulting in hollow, degenerate lifestyles geared towards consumption and profit, breaking down morality and society wherever they are spread. Willi Mutzenberg, the German communist activist, and one of the founders of the Frankfurt School. Remember, that was the school when it disbanded, many of those professors came west and settled in Colombia. And it's been a hotbed for Marxism since. He said these words, quote, we must organize the intellectuals and use them to make Western civilization stink. Only then, after they have corrupted all its values and made life impossible, can we impose the dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote. Indeed, as described in previous chapters of this book, the heritage of Western civilization has been replaced by deviated modern pop culture, and its spiritual values have been largely overturned by variants of Marxism. Globalization and globalism bring this degeneracy to all corners of the earth. Globally, the United States leads in the political, economic, and military arenas. Its unique position in these fields carries over to American popular culture, which has been readily accepted and adopted by other countries and regions. After infiltrating and corrupting family life, politics, the economy, law, arts, the media, and popular culture across all aspects of daily life in the United States, Communism made use of cultural globalization to export this corrupted culture. So you go ahead, you inject America with trash, 
We're going to make it stink from their music to their fashions to their dress to television to movies. We're going to make the whole thing stink. And then we're going to spread it out through the world. But we're going to start there. Though ho through Hollywood movies, even the inhabitants of China's far-flung conservative inland villages learn that single motherhood, extramarital affairs, and sexual liberation were all quote-unquote normal aspects of life in the quote-unquote advanced West. See? So, single motherhood and government checks and all that, that's, that's normal. You want that. Who wants a family? Who wants a husband? Who wants a wife? Who wants that? Who wants what the Bible has for you? We're the government. We'll take care of you. Rock and roll became extremely popular across the world. From Ecuador and South America to Malaysia and Southeast Asia to Fiji and the Pacific Islands. In education, the ideology underpinning the common core curriculum created by cultural Marxists was almost instantaneously reflected in Taiwan's secondary school textbooks. By the way, reading a book, The Marxification of Edification, or Education, uh, Dr. Uh, James Lindsay, if I'm not mistaken, goes into how all of the, all, really, schools in America are just indoctrination places now. They're not teaching, actually. Yeah, they'll throw in some ABCs and one, two, threes every now and then. But when you send your child to a school, or God forbid, a university, they're being indoctrinated. They're not being educated. In the blink of an eye, the Occupy Wall Street movement in New York was shown on television screens as the remotest mountain hamlets of India. Cultural globalization is the hurricane that blows the deviant culture of the West and the party culture of communist totalitarian regimes throughout the entire world, relentlessly sweeping away the traditional values that have guided humanity for thousands of years. And by the way, what else did Michelle Obama say? You're going to have to change your history, and you're going to have to change your tradition. Every ethnic culture has unique characteristics and carries the deep influences of its own special history. Despite the differences between ethnic customs, they all observe the same divinely bestowed universal values in their traditions. Kind of like, oh, I don't know, marriage, husband and a wife. Well, you do understand that whole husband-wife stuff. I mean, that's all white supremacy, right? Which is spurred on by real white Bible. After the Industrial Revolution, technological development brought about convenience and simultaneously tradition was labeled by progressives as backward. You people getting married? Why? Just live together. What's wrong with that? Who wants to get married? What a, what a hurdle. Don't you want freedom? I mean, it'd be great, right? You can have as much sex as you want with no entanglements and no commitment. Measuring everything based on its modernness, novelty, and progress, or whether it is commercial value, is now standard. Communism promotes values that seem noble, but in reality are aimed at having humankind abandon traditional values, replacing them with homogenous and deteriorated modern values instead. Today's so-called common values formed by cultural exchange in the process of globalization aren't from any particular tradition. They are modern values. The elements and values that are adopted by globalism must, by necessity, deviate from tradition. They include only the crassest elements of existing cultural heritage, as well as the aspects that can be commercialized. Notions about the common destiny of humankind and our common future are the results of such deviated values. The lowest standard that is recognized during cultural globalization manifests in consumer culture. Product design and marketing driven by economic interests are entirely centered on appealing to consumers' base instincts. The aim is to control humankind by seducing, 
indulging and satisfying people's superficial desire. This global consumerist culture is used to corrupt tradition in multiple ways. First, the unique characteristics and meaning behind a product as originated from its ethnic culture are removed. In other words, tradition is taken away from products through deculturalization or standardization. The more alienated a group of people is from their cultural heritage and faith, the more susceptible they become to such a signified consumerist culture. Over time, through globalization, this population's customs and identity devolve to only the low level ne necessary to maintain a cheap commercial culture bereft of meaning and morality. Second, the globalized media industry and its monopolies have enabled communist elements to easily make use of the degenerated ideas behind products. They advertise the su superficial cultural aspects of products and introduce Marxist ideology while promoting them. The hybridization of cultures through globalization thus becomes another channel for promoting communist ideology. Third, a global culture makes consumerism the mainstream culture of society. Commercials, films, television shows, social media constantly bombard consumers with the idea that they are not living a real life if they don't consume our own certain products or seek to be entertained in particular ways, and you need the latest iPhone. Not that anything's wrong with the one you got. Communism also uses different means and entertainment to prompt people to pursue the satisfaction of their base desires. As people indulge these desires, they move away from the spiritual plane, causing them to deviate from their long-held divine beliefs and traditional values within a few short generations. Who really needs to leave your home anymore to go to shul or Shabbat or go to church? I got a smartphone. I don't even leave, need to leave my house. As communism quickly spreads its deteriorated ideology amid the backdrop of globalization, it utilizes the herd mentality. With frequent exposure to news media, social media, commercials, television shows, and films, people are bombarded with various anti-traditional ideas and narratives. This creates an illusion that such deteriorated trends represent a global consensus. People gradually become numb to the damage wrought by these ideologies as twisted behaviors come to be seen as fashionable and people are urged to take pride in them. Substance abuse, sexual liberation, degenerate music, abstract art, and much more are all spread in this fashion. You ever get a group of teenagers together anymore? Have you ever seen a group of teenagers? Young people? No emotion. Faceless. All they see is the phone. And whatever the phone is, whatever the phone is showing them, well, that's the way the world is. Modern art is degenerate and violates all traditional definitions of, of aesthetics. Some people may have known this from the very start, but after modern artworks are constantly exhibited in major metropolitan areas and sold at high prices, and when the media frequently reports on dark and strange works, normal people begin to believe that they're the ones who've fallen out of touch with fashion. And that it's their, you, their taste in art that needs to be updated. What's wrong with you people? You don't know that Christ on a cross in a jar of urine? That's cool. And if you don't, you got a problem with that. You got the problem. Gaslighted by this trend, people learn to deny their innate sense of what constitutes beauty and accept the hideous aesthetics of deteriorated art. All manner of degenerate culture masked as Western culture is currently being spread to every corner of the world. Hollywood, in particular, has been a major carrier of various narratives that stem from cultural Marxism. The special characteristics of the movie industry allow it to make people subconsciously accept its values. 
Film has the power to depict compelling atmospheres, narratives, and personalities, immersing audiences in the director's viewpoint. Hollywood movies play an enormous role in shaping audiences' values and worldview. In this book, we have also discussed how cultural Marxism has taken over Western education and in turn exposed foreign students studying in Western countries to various leftist ideologies. When they return to their countries, they spread these ideologies, which are seen as attractive because Western countries are more technologically advanced and economically developed. And a number of these countries are starting to catch on. You want to send your 20-year-old to college in America? They'll bring that trash back. Thus, invasive modern trends encounter little resistance as they spread and destroy the local traditional culture. These modern globalist values have also become ubiquitous and mainstream via the corporate culture of multinational corporations. Their promotion of sexual liber liberation has seriously corroded the moral values of traditional society. You think Target cares about you getting upset about their pride display? I want you to imagine this. I go ahead, all right, I keep biblical kosher, but for argument's sake, I take five boxes from a pizza shop of the, the meat lover's pizza. I mean, you got nasty pork pepperoni on there and nasty pork everything. But I'm going to take all five of them, and I'm going to take them to a vegetarian conference. Now, do you know what's going to happen when I walk in there into a vegetarian conference with five boxes of meat lover's pizza? They're going to hate me. I'll get shooed out the door, they'll throw rocks at me, they'll spit at me, and everything. But if the following week I come back with five boxes of meat lover's pizza into that same vegetarian conference a week later, they won't be that mean to me. They still won't eat it, right? They'll ignore it, whatever. I'll get a few comments. And then over time, I come back the next week with five boxes of meat lover's pizza into that vegetarian conference. And you know what's going to happen over time? Not only will they not eject, they'll start eating it. You think Target doesn't know what they're doing? Target's going to come back next June. Walmart's going to come back next June. Kohl's is going to come back next June. And they're just going to flood you. And over time, as you old people start dying off, the young people will embrace them. In 2016, a large global chain retailer, Target, announced that their store dressing rooms and restrooms would be friendly to transgender people meaning that men could enter women's restrooms or locker rooms at will if they self-identified as women. And by the way, if you have a problem with that now, you're the, you're the issue. How dare you? You mean to tell me that my 17-year-old transgender son or daughter can't go into the girls' locker room and see all those girls naked? Well, what's wrong with you? You're the problem. The American Family Association said the policy was harmful to women and children and called on consumers to boycott the company. To date, the association's pledge to boycott the store chain has received more than 1.5 million signatures. Boycotts have become unrealistic. However, as more and more companies across society have adopted such policies, communism is able to utilize the herd mentality because many people do not have a strong will. Eventually, you will go back. Eventually, you will eat the meat lover's pizza. I just have to keep putting it in front of your face over and over and over. And I will change your values. Once humankind deviates from divinely imparted traditions, everything becomes relative and changes over time. The situation becomes ripe for exploitation. 
Folks, that's why you never give up your Bible. That book will never change. The book that some of you have on your lap, hold on dearly to it. It will never change. It will never fail you. Everything around this world may go to hell in a handbasket. That book will keep you safe. Under the conditions of globalization, mutual respect and tolerance of different national cultures have become mainstream. Communism has used this to distort the concept of tolerance and make value neutrality a global consensus, thereby advocating deviant ideas. In closing, by the way, the phrase I use, they're going to make a new human, that's, that's not me saying that. That was Klaus Schwab. When we are done, we will have changed what it means to be human. Again, don't get caught up in the details. I'm serious. Whether it's AI, the chips, digital dollar, 15-minute cities, the passports, it's just noise. I'm serious. It's just noise. This is an ideology. This is a spirit at work. And God is allowing it because he has to allow it. He has to be true to his word. So the system's going to come about. The new world order will come about. And it has to come about so Yeshua can destroy it. And he will establish his government. And he will establish his throne. And we look forward to that. But don't get caught up in the details. Help you out a little bit. Not to get off into a whole nother topic, whole nother lesson. Believers, especially after, you know, after 2020 and 2021, and, and you had passports and you had vaccines and you had all that stuff, right? And I was hearing some believers, you know, oh man, I mean, I don't want to take the mark. I have great news for you. You cannot. Are you saved? Are you born again? You have the indwelling Holy Spirit forever and ever. You cannot take that mark because you've been purchased with his blood. We are talking about an ideology, a mindset, where you reject God and you worship the devil. And if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, that's not going to happen. You have this ideology. We haven't seen anything yet. When this thing comes to its fruition, you are talking about human beings on this planet as God is pouring out his wrath on this planet. There is no water to drink, and there is pain, and there is suffering, right? And there's earthquakes, and all of it, and God is pouring out his wrath on this planet. And you have human beings gnawing on their tongues, blaspheming him. And that's what Satan is creating. In June of 2020, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, famously declared that the Chinese coronavirus was an opportunity for global governments to introduce his words, not mine, a great reset of capitalism. The globalist German engineer argued that, quote, the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economies, end quote. The call for a new age has been long-standing from the Davos-based group and a 2016 video predicting a happy future in which individuals no longer own property. In fact, let me, sh let me read to you in the video it says these, quote, words. Welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city. Or should I say, our city. I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes, end quote. And that's coming. What have I told you? You want to take my house? Take my house. I got a mansion waiting for me. <laughs> you can take that whole thing. I got something that is going to last me forever and ever. So you can take all that. Communism. The spirit. The spirit of Antichrist. 
Final words. On a global scale, the devil seeks to spread communist ideology to political systems everywhere with the goal of undermining nation states and establishing a global ruling body. This is the quote unquote paradise on earth promised in communism, a supposed collective society without class, nations, or government based on the principle of, from Marx himself, from each according to his ability and to each according to his need. Communists claim that they are establishing a heaven on earth, but this is precisely their greatest lie. And the only fruit this lie has borne is a hell on earth. Take a look around the world, whether it's Cuba, whether it's North Korea, whether, just take a look. Beautiful countries, over 90% poverty now. People are scratching and clawing to get away from that. Imagine, how many people do you know that would get on a boat and travel to get into Cuba? It's so good there. Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for your truth. We have an eternal home. It can never be taken away from us. Never, ever can it ever be taken away. Because we didn't earn it. It's by your grace. You sent your only begotten Son to die in our place. You've sent us your truth. You've sent us light. Light exposes darkness. We're able to clearly see what the enemy is up to. Clearly. And yet at the same time, as we see these things unfolding, and it's been going on for a number of years, Lord, that's true. Can't help but say there's a peace. There's a peace in my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well because I know that you're in total and complete, you're totally and complete in charge. You are on your throne. You always have been. You always will be. So let these things come to pass. Lord, I pray that we not only continue to study these things, we don't get fearful, we don't get worried, but we remain steadfast. But we also sound the alarm. We sound the alarm. We tell our loved ones, we tell our neighbors of these things. But we also tell them not only of these things, but we also tell them of the hope that we have, that these things that are happening, they're not disrupting us. In fact, they're exciting. They're exciting to us. Because we can hear you coming. We look forward to that day. Lord, I want to lift up our young people to you. I want to lift up our young people. These teenagers, these children, teenagers, young adults. They're so immersed into these phones. It's as if they can't get their eyes off of them and that whole time they're just being indoctrinated and immersed into this trash, into these lies. Lord, as adults, those of us with the truth, not only do we lift up our children to you and, to our, and our grandchildren as well and our nieces and our nephews, Lord, give us the boldness to also help to show them that they don't have the truth in that phone, but we have the truth in our Bible. We pray for our young people. Lord, I pray for our leaders. Our leaders, many of them, many of them, they know exactly what's happening on both sides of the aisles. Whether they're Democrats, Republicans, Independents, they know exactly what's happening. But there are those, not many, but there are those that truly know you, and we can call them brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray that you protect them, that you watch over and you protect their families. They're trying to battle from that particular stage, the governmental stage, they're trying to battle this darkness, this evil that's coming. Lord, they will eventually they will fail. But that doesn't mean we don't fight. But strengthen them. Strengthen them and protect them and their families as well. Whether they be congresspeople, senators, governors, what have you. Lord, thank you so much for this time as we continue to try and learn and try to prepare. But also at the same time, 
it does give us a peace. It gives us a peace because we know what tomorrow brings. That tomorrow is with you. We look forward to that day. We pray all of these things, Lord, in Yeshua's precious name. Amen.